Today, we're going to be talking about testing and training lower half power in baseball players and some of the things we do here at RPP to assess power in the lower half and to uh, use those results to help us individualize our programming and give the athlete a little bit more of what they need. In this presentation, we'll talk about what we test, how we test it, why we test it, and some things to look for to help you with your programming and to get a more detailed look into your player in their initial assessment. But I'd first like to thank Phil Tomasi, one of my head strength and conditioning coaches here at RPP, for helping me out with this uh, PowerPoint. And without further ado, let's get it done. But first, we have to realize that peak power happens at different velocities for different athletes but lives somewhere around 30 to 70% of a one rep max, or if we're using VBT, 0.80 to 1.2 meters per second. But just getting a power number is just not enough. It's how it's achieved that's important. For example, power equals force times velocity. So if an athlete is creating, say, 4,000 watts of power, this could be coming from 800 watts of force and 500 watts of power, which would give us our 4,000, or it could be coming from 800 watts of velocity and 500 watts of force, um, which is the reverse, and which would also give us 4,000 watts of power. Much depends on the type of athlete that we have in front of us as to how and what they use as the preferred method to produce the most power. For our first athlete who produces most of his power coming from force, we're going to train that athlete more in speed strength to get that velocity side of power, which takes precedence at speed strength zones. Um, for our athlete, the second athlete who uses velocity to create more of his power, we're going to train him more in strength speed, which trains force predominantly and velocity also, but predominantly force uh, to get that force side up for him. We're testing power in the sagittal plane with two vertical jumps, and we're also testing power in the frontal plane, which is the one test that we really put a lot of stock in due to the fact that this is the plane that pitchers spend a lot of time in, most baseball players actually, with a lateral RSI. The two jumps that we use to test power in the sagittal plane are the counter movement jump and the squat jump. And for testing power in the frontal plane, we use a lateral RSI or a box drop Hyden. These tests can tell us a lot about how well an athlete utilizes their stretch shortening cycle, or SSC as we sometimes call it. This will allow us to train the desired trait needed instead of simply pasting generic training programs to athletes and possibly not getting any adaptations at all, or even making things worse. The way it works is this. A well-balanced athlete's CMJ jump should be approximately 10 to 15% higher than their squat jump due to the use of the stretch shortening cycle. In our assessment, based off of how well the athlete utilizes his or her stretch shortening cycle, the programming is adjusted to give the athlete more of what they need, strength or elasticity, to better create power. For the box drop Hyden, a lateral reactive strength index, or RSI, is given based on how quickly the athlete reacts to the ground and how far they jump. We put a lot of stock in this particular assessment, the lateral power or the box drop Hyden, and it also gives us a good idea if the pitcher it feels more comfortable in the stretch or in the windup, as well as tells us what phase plyometrics they should be training in. We're going to assume that there are no injuries or mobility issues present and take a look at these jumps individually. Let's first look at the CMJ. CMJ tells us a lot about an athlete's elasticity or their ability to kind of flip the switch from eccentric force production, which is their landing, to taking off again, which is concentric. This is also known as the amortization phase. Below is an example of one of our athletes who displays greater than that 10 to 15% that we are looking for and therefore needs to train force. You can see here that he's got roughly... Uh, 18% higher of a counter movement jump than a squat jump, and that puts him in a force deficit. This requires a higher rate of force production to help move this athlete's curve more towards the force side of the equation. To do that, we need to take one of two paths. We either need to improve max strength if this shows to be an issue in the athlete's initial strength assessment in the weight room, or strength speed 
if max strength has been determined adequate. This will help us work more on the acceleration component of force production. And this can be accomplished many different ways. Different trainers and coaches go about it different ways. According to Zatsiorski and SIF, peak force is attained using loads at approximately 60 to 80% of an athlete's one rep max. If you're using VBT, this is around 0.5 to 0.75 meters per second. Some examples of this that can be used are deadlifts, squats, rear foot elevated split squats. And on the strength speed side, this has been shown to be optimal at loads between 40 and 60% of an athlete's one rep max. Uh, VBT would be 0.75 to 1.0. And some examples of this would be band resisted exercises, Olympic lifts, things that are um, allowing us to accelerate through the load for a longer period of time and kind of eliminate some of that deceleration that happens. So those bands help our athlete continue to produce force throughout the entire range of motion and thus help his acceleration. On the other side of the coin, we have athletes who actually create close to the same amount of power without the use of the stretch shortening cycle. This is the purpose of the squat jump. We instruct the athlete to hold the jump in the low position for approximately three seconds and then perform the jump without any eccentric loading at all. The three second hold allows the energy attained through the eccentric movement to dissipate as heat out of the body and force the athlete to use muscular force exclusively without any help from the SSC. This time, if we look at the graph on the bottom, we can see that the CMJ was only 7% higher when the stretch shortening cycle was engaged. These velocity deficient athletes many times are plenty strong in the weight room, but have a hard time expressing that strength quickly. This rapid flicking of the switch from eccentric to concentric force requires efficient rates of force development. So, where our force deficient athletes from the last few slides needed to train more force production and strength, these stronger athletes and less elastic athletes may be better served by spending more time in the offseason training speed strength and plyometrics while simply maintaining the strength they already possess. Once again, this can be accomplished through various types of training. If we're going to train speed strength, this happens at approximately 20 to 40% of an athlete's 1RM, or if we're using VBT, 1.0 to 1.3 meters per second. Some examples of drill work can be trap bar jumps, med balls, Olympic lifts once again, and band-assisted exercises like we see here on the right. Some examples of plyometric work would be reactive Haydn's, pogo jumps, or CMJ jumps themselves. And these drills are usually performed at or around body weight to 20% of 1RM and can be added into a movement day if time is of the essence. For testing power in the frontal plane, which is pure gold for ball players, we use a box drop Haydn. By taking the distance jumped in meters and dividing it by the contact time off of a jump mat, we can calculate what we call a lateral RSI or reactive strength index. In a study we did back in 2017, we went to five Division I colleges and tested approximately 30 to 40 pitchers. The average RSI was between 5.0 and 6.0, so it allowed us to use these metrics to tell us how explosive our guys were in the frontal plane. This is demonstrated to the right along with the testing info below. For athletes scoring below 5.0, we first need to work on their ability to decelerate, in other words, landing. We use what is termed slow stretch shortening cycle exercises or SSC exercises, which means that a time component of greater than 250 milliseconds is used. In other words, we're building eccentric strength. Some great exercises are lateral lunges and repeated lateral hydens. For athletes scoring above 5.0, we begin to work on the amortization phase. That's the flicking of the switch I mentioned previously, only this time, we're performing it laterally. Some great exercises are step back med ball throws and double bounding. These accentuate getting in and out of our landing. And finally, I wanted to show before and after testing on 20 of our college guys in this summer's development program. On the left, we can see initial testing on the CMJ, squat jump, and lateral RSI. And on the right, the retest performed at the program's end. We can see in the retest that gains were made in all categories, this being jump height, 
power, and most importantly, gains in the lateral RSI were significant. I'd like to thank everybody for tuning in and checking out this webinar and let you know that we can be reached at 40 Eisenhower Drive in Paramus, New Jersey, and our Twitter is RPP underscore baseball, and our website is www.rocklandpeakperformance.com. Thanks.